Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and get cozy because you are listening to Mindful as a Mother with Paige Bruce and Lindsay Adams. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for therapy or the therapeutic relationship, and the information given in this podcast is purely for educational purposes and is not intended to replace the advice of a professional. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Mindful as a Mother. So we are actually on a podcast weekend, but it looks a little bit different this time. We're on Zoom. So all of our um, batches for the next little bit will be on Zoom because life. Yeah, my husband has strep throat. How dare he? Um, But luckily, no one else has gotten it yet. My throat's feeling a little sore today. So I'm like, but I feel okay. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. So we're, we're going to wing it. We're going to do it. We're winging it. We're, we're, talk, we're talking about co-regulation, which is super important. And I don't think a lot of people, like, it, it's a hot word out there right now. You're scrolling wherever you scroll, and you see that we need to co-regulate with our kids. But for the most part, people don't understand what that actually means and what that l- looks like, because it looks very different for every kid. I always get worried when I use the term regulation or dysregulated because I think it's a very scientific term to like simplify it. It means stressed, right? And so when you are dysregulated, it's like you're stressed, you're having intense emotions. They could be anger, they could be sadness, could be any of those things. And when we talk about regulation, that's when you're not stressed or like you're under a manageable amount of stress. Yes. And um, I think it's a a hard concept to understand because it has so much to do with like something we feel in our body, which can be really hard to describe. Um, But if you think of it like your child, maybe like going into fight or flight or getting activated, if, if you have a child that's highly emotional, I think you'll know what I'm talking about when you're like, it's a meltdown, like there, it's a stress response there is a very visible like click and your kid is in survival mode. Yes, exactly. And so when we say co-regulation, we are saying you're regulating with. So you are moving with your child through their emotions to help them understand what's happening and come back to a place where they're less stressed or under a manageable amount of stress and emotion. So that really is what co-regulation is. And the simplest way to describe it is you're sharing your calm nervous system with them yeah there's that quote that's like as a parent it's not my job to what was it something about chaos in the storm but to be the calm in their storm I don't know yeah the internet says it better than me but that's basically the concept is like you're able to remain calm and understand what's happening for you you're able to mean maintain your regulation not that you're not experiencing emotion or stress but it's a, you're you're keeping it at a manageable amount with the skills that you've learned to support your kids how to learn those same skills to be able to work through this level of stress and emotion. So now that we know what it is, let's talk about how you do it. And it's first thing, it's going to be different for every single child. Like I have one child that needs me to just sit next to them and not speak, not touch them, just be there. I have one that needs to be like hugged and cuddled and I have one that needs physical activity and so it's just knowing that every child's going to be different and when you think you have one child figured out that's cool you've got one child figured out you've got to figure out your other ones too yeah one child for one emotion so actually last night I have uh, my middle kiddo is one that usually really likes to be like held and hugged and that's what helps her regulate that's what helps her work through her emotions and calm down and I'm not always available for that and Lindsay and I just taught our call mom happy kids course shameless plug where we walk through different real-time skills to use as a parent to help yourself um, work through those tough emotions and then you can apply them to your kids right okay so real time 
something happened on the trampoline. At this point, I don't know what, because when my children go outside, that is feral territory and and who knows? <laughs> We're on the trampoline being feral in the rain. So all of a sudden she's like, my kiddo comes in, she's scream crying, wailing, like having difficulty breathing. <sighs> and my hands are covered in whatever I was making for dinner. And I was like, hey, go ahead and put your hand on your heart. It's like, put your hand on your heart. So what I know about my kid is that typically like holding her, hugging her, that kind of sensation helps her regulate. And I wasn't available to do that at the time. And because we just taught this class, one of the real time skills we talked about was how putting your hand on your heart simulates a hug to your body. And so what I did, I told her, I was like, put your hand on your heart. And, you know, sometimes when I try to coach her through, like, this is like, God, take deep breaths or whatever. She's like, yeah and then wails even more so she put her hand on her heart and I was surprised one because she actually did it sometimes she gives me pushback but this is the first time I recommended this to her and then I was like okay now take deep breath and I just like stood there with her and I took deep breath while she did and she kept her hand on her heart and she just kind of like followed me around the kitchen while I was like trying to wash off my hands from this raw meat and and very short into that, she had calmed herself down. She had stopped wailing. I like her breathing slowed down. It didn't happen immediately, but I would say much faster than typical. It was like within 20 seconds of doing it. And then she didn't even tell me what happened. At that point, she no longer cared. And she actually just like moved on with her evening routine. That's amazing. And I think the reason that we want to do this with our kids, especially our neurodivergent ones, is they're going to have big feelings their entire life. Like that, that piece of them is not going away. And by doing this, we one model to them how to regulate. And two, we show them that even if we get upset sometimes or we react sometimes that we can handle their big feelings. So there's a feeling of safety and there's nothing wrong with them for having this feeling, these feelings. And that's what we're communicating to them by showing up and helping them regulate. I would say the number one mistake I see parents make when it comes to this is trying to talk their kid through regulation. As in like sitting down, talking with them on a cognitive level, not like prompting skills and things like that, like Paige did. So Paige, can you explain from, cause you're the sciencey one, from a sciencey perspective, like why like logic and reasoning isn't going to help when your child's that activated. So I'm trying to think of the best place to start. And I was really brainstorming this all last night. Cause I know we've been working up to recording this podcast and the easiest way I can explain it is I'm going to ask everybody to take this visualization and turn your hand into a brain. So I want you just to have an open palm and I want you to fold your thumb in. So your thumb is resting over your palm and then your fingers on top of it. So you're like basically squeezing your thumb inside of your fist. So this is an imitation of our brain. And I teach this to children too. And this Same. is like, Same. this is how I help them understand it. And oftentimes I refer to it as flipping our lid. So the part of our brain that supports us in staying calm, um, reasoning, problem solving, like that logic, that lecturing that we like default to as parents exists within our fingers. And if I just popped off the top of my head and placed my hand brain inside, then the fingers would live behind my forehead. This is the prefrontal cortex or the wise owl. This is the wise owl of your brain because it helps you make wise decisions and problem solve. And so when we move into a place where we're really, really, really stressed, that part of our brain flips. And so now when I say that, I want you to just to straighten your fingers up. So now your thumbs on your palm and your fingers are straight up. So that's gone. That part of your brain is not online. It's not functioning because you flipped your lid. It's gone. So your thumb represents the protective guard dog. Lindsay, have you heard these analogies before? <laughs> yes, and I use them even with adults. So it's funny because they're meant for kids, but they hit real hard with adults. Yes, okay. So your thumb represents the part of your brain that 
its main focus is to feel your feelings and to keep you safe. So we call it the guard dog. It's the protective part. And kids really like it because I talk about how it's like the size of a walnut deep in the middle of your brain. And so it's like a tiny walnut puppy <laughs> that barks when it thinks you're in danger. So when you get stressed, you get overwhelmed, or your children experience big feelings, their brain is stressed, that guard dog is like, something's happening. And it's like, blah, 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 and barks, right? So what do birds do? Or what does an owl do when the dog barks? It flies away. So when we're stressed, we flip our lid and the part of our brain, our wise owl that helps us maintain our ability to reason and problem solve flies away until the dog calms down. And that's like the, I think the most simplified analogy that I use on a daily basis to understand the foundation, very simplified foundation of feeling our feelings and regulating our emotions and why lecturing and doesn't work. Yes, and and so you have to meet your child's brain where they are at. So if they are a barking puppy, you have to calm the barking puppy down. And how do you calm a barking puppy down? You pet it, you tell it it's gonna be okay, that it's safe. And then once the barking puppy is calm, then the logic and reasoning part of their brain is lit back up and you can connect with them in whatever way you need to. And this is where I think a lot of parents get confused, especially all the trolls on Facebook who tell yeah. us that like um, the our way of parenting is permissive parenting or that co-regulation is permissive parenting. And it's not at all, but think of yourself, like how is something going to land for you if you're like really activated and someone is um, trying to talk you through or lecture you. I know as a kid, I just tuned out. Like I literally probably dissociated from my body and was like, I, I don't remember anything they said to me. I did not learn any lesson from that. I did not learn any skills, right? But if we can wait until that part of the brain comes back on, then you want to close the cycle, right? And mm -hmm. have a conversation about like what they can do next time, tools they can use if they need to be taught something like, um, for example, my kids were on the trampoline with water balloons and with the neighbor kids. And um, my eight year old son was jumping and they were playing a game with the water balloons, but he wanted to smash them. And they wanted to like run around and try not to let the balloons touch them. And so I like explained it to him. He got really upset. So I had him get off the tramp and like co-regulate with me. And once he had calmed down, I, I was able to explain to him, buddy, they are playing a game. And when you stomp on their balloons, you are ruining their game. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, okay. And he got it. And he realized that that's like not fun for them. And then he got back up there and was fine. Mm -hmm. So it's that you, you have to calm them down enough for them to hear you. And then when they can hear you, then you can tell them what you need to tell them. And then use half the amount of words you want to use because we talk too much anyway. Yeah. As adults. Right. And the next episode, episode 14, we're going to teach you guys how to teach regulation to your kids. Um, but this always reminds me of this thing I do as a parent. And I know so many other people resonate where I told my child not to do something or blah, 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 whatever they do it. And they get hurt or they have big emotions or they're mad. And my instinct is to be like, well, that's why I told you not to climb on the tree or, you know, like, that's why yeah, I told I you. I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> that's my instinct. And it doesn't work. Or if my kid, so kiddo moving into preteen land, hormones, super angry about, gosh, there was, she was so angry with me about having her brush her hair <laughs> last night. <laughs> So she was already angry about having to brush her hair. And so I wasn't like, well, we need to brush it every day because you want long hair. And with long hair, you have to care for it. That is a conversation I've had with her. But in the moment when she's already angry, I know her dog is barking. So the owl is nowhere to be seen. And I have to wait for it to come back. So that's why we tell you. And then while she was mad, she was being short with me. And this is another one of those why we say being a responsive parent does not mean being permissive, like you're not parenting or you're not setting limits or boundaries because she started talking to me in a way that I believed was disrespectful. And so as a parent, I said, 
I don't like the way you're talking to me right now. It feels disrespectful. If it continues, there will be a consequence. And then I didn't push it anymore. I didn't demand she corrects it in the moment. But then when her owl came back online, she apologized to me. I love that. And I we've talked about how Sam did that with the pancakes before. And it's, it's good because they can, um, you see them start to close the cycle on their own, right? Like they recognize once they have calmed down, they may just do the, the thing, the right thing, right? Like, and it's so cool to watch your kids do that. And a lot of times I don't think we give them the opportunity because we expect them to respond or react when they're activated. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I want to, and I had to be really careful with this because um, I do support like walking away and taking space. And my children started to take it too far where they were upset with something I was saying to them. So they would walk away from me in the middle of my sentence or instead of doing the thing that I had asked them to do, they're like, well, I just need space to calm down, right? I was like, I understand that you need space and you can have it after you do the thing that I've asked you to do. Like, it's not okay for you to walk away from me in the middle of my sentence just because you don't like what I am saying, right? So like, there are still boundaries and expectations. And yeah, after you do the thing that I've asked you to do, you're welcome to take space. And they did the thing and they did it in a way that was angry, right? Like it wasn't destructive, but there was still a little bit of what we would call attitude with it. Like, I always have to do everything and why, and did, 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 right? Like under their breath. And so something else to know is that when we are working through this level of emotion, this level of stress, we're going to move into fight, flight, on or freeze. And all of this is really important information to know and understand when we're talking about regulation. So those little things under their breath, like, D -d 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 and I hate this, this is worse, I have the most dumb life ever, right? So being hypercritical of yourself and others is a fight response. So that right there was a signal to me that like, yes, she's doing the thing that I asked. She's also dysregulated. So I'm not going to get after her right now about saying those things. I'm going to let her complete the task and then take the space to regulate. I love that. And it takes so much self-control because we all have our own. And this is something really important for this, like knowing what you're bringing to the situation. So like, what am I bringing in as far as like my physical needs? Like, have I eaten? Have I slept? Do I need water? Have I had a break? Whatever, all those things. But then also like my experiences. So um, my triggers both like, from a sensory standpoint and just from an emotional one, disrespect is a big one to me because it was a big thing in my house growing up that you don't back talk like if you, and and it was like you say anything in response to what your parent is saying to you that is considered back talking and you're in trouble. So when it gets disrespectful, like something is deeply triggered in me and it takes so much self control for me to just let that go and then come back and address it later. Mm hmm. I heard something a little controversial on a podcast I was listening to, and I want to know what your thoughts are on this. All right. Okay. Was, <laughs> what? I said, throw it at me. Let's try. Okay. So it's a child psychologist, and I don't know who the other person is, talking about how um, when our kids tell us to leave them alone or go away when they are really activated, that it's usually them expressing verbally their worst fears and so she we should not leave them alone or go away we should give them space but remain in the same room um i feel like every time i get questions like this people hate my answers because i say it's a mixed bag like sometimes yeah. yes but can we use that as blanket advice for every single child absolutely not like it's so nuanced mm -hmm. and so like you probably know if your kid is saying something, but they really want you to stay there. And that's where, so like my son, for me, that's what it is. Like, he'll tell me like he needs alone time or go away. But like, but then I'll say, do you want me to sit in here with you? And he will absolutely say yes, 100% of the time. So mm -hmm. I sit in there, I don't talk, but like I'm giving him space. Whereas one of my girls, like she legitimately wants to be left alone and does not want me in the room until she's ready to talk about it. And that's cool. I let her do that. 
Exactly. And I think that's why it's so powerful to teach these concepts in a way that parents can understand when we didn't learn them growing up. <laughs> But two, because it helps us gain the ability to read our children to know what the appropriate nuanced response is for them. Because same, I have one that if I try to be in the room with them when they've asked me not to, then all hell breaks loose and they continue to become more upset versus the other one where I can be in the room and I'm just like, hey, I'm over here when you're ready. And it's a different Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And I think the way that we can tell is if your child starts to calm down, then you know that it, you're making the right response. But if they get more escalated, it's yeah. not correct. Response. And it's going to be trial and error for each child and sometimes for each scenario or situation. And this is the beauty of being able to attune. There's another fancy word, right? Which means um, you are able to connect to your child physically and emotionally and meet their needs, like perceive, anticipate and meet their needs. And the more practice we have with that, with any other human, the better we get at it. She's like each of these opportunities as a parent, we want to be able to stay regulated. We want to be able to know how to work through our big feelings. So that way we can better attune to our children. Yes, absolutely. And then I don't think this episode would be complete unless we talked about the window of tolerance, and also the different responses in dysregulation, or like the stress responses, fight, fight, fawn, or freeze, fawn, <laughs> and kind of some like real time responses out of each of those categories. So we can start to kind of learn when, when our kids are asking to co-regulate with us. Yes, because I think picking up on the cues um, from our kids is the hardest part because they don't usually express what they need verbally like adults do oh even adults don't do that. Mm -hmm. but um so being able to like read their vibes is difficult so we'll walk through that but first Paige I'm so focused today uh have you been taking your magic mind every morning it is the most amazing thing ever so it is a little green shot that you take. I take mine after my coffee first thing in the morning and it helps you be calm and present and alert and focused, but with no like jittery crash. I don't feel, cause sometimes when I take stuff like that, like I'm on edge and I feel like I'm anxious or I'm going to explode on everyone around me. I don't feel like that at all. And I just feel so in the zone. And I think it's because it has, ashwagandha in it matcha green tea is a caffeine and other really really great healthy things that I probably can't pronounce I'm sure yeah I think there's so much hype right now around the adaptogens which everyone's like oh my gosh take adaptogens if you're neurodivergent but this one actually helps me feel like a healthy queen and I get it in and then I don't have the afternoon crash love it um so try it out yeah, you, uh, you will love it as much as we do. What's our code page? Yeah, if you guys are interested, you can check it out at www.magicmind.com forward slash mothers. And you're going to get 50% off of your subscription with the code mothers20. So check it out. We're going to walk through the window of tolerance. And I don't know that this is a very well known concept. At least it wasn't to me until I was a therapist. Lindsay, did you know about this as a parent before you were a, a counselor? I was a counselor before I was a parent. Oh, yeah. So you so, knew about window of tolerance before kids? Yes, but not to the degree in which I know about it today. I think so. What I became a therapist in 2013, 12, somewhere in there. Um, and <laughs> polyvagal theory wasn't really taught. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I've learned more and it's been taught more, I've learned more about it, definitely, even since I've become a parent. Absolutely. And when I was younger and I was reading all these different parenting books, these psychology books, this was not something that was discussed. So I'm going to break it down a little bit. Every living being, maybe even plants, have a window of tolerance. And this is like an ancient system within our body. Again, I'm here with the science, always pulling up, Okay. So I want you to actually think of it like a window, like picture a window in your brain. 
So what this is or what it means is we operate within this window throughout our day and we just kind of like wave through it, like up and down. And that is when we experience like little stressors and then we regulate and then maybe we're down a little bit, like really tired and need to re-energize and then we're back up and it's normal. It's like when you're playing sports, you're waving within that window of tolerance. When we're wrestling with our kids, our kids are waving within that window of tolerance. This is when our body feels a little bit of stress or emotion, and then we regulate again. So the reason co-regulation is so important is because you are designed, your nervous system, since this is your child, is designed to regulate your child's nervous system or window of tolerance. And so when they're little, like teeny tiny babies, and they cry, you respond to their cries, you are teaching them their window of tolerance. So like they're getting a little bit stressed out, and then we're meeting those needs, and then they're regulating, then we're getting stressed out. So we're developing a pattern here of safety in the stress, because stress is normal. We want to experience stress, we want to experience the emotions, and we want to have the capacity for that. And so then that happens to like toddlers when you roughhouse with toddlers, right? Or even I have an, my nine-year-old is always roughhousing. It's the same thing. So we're stressing them within their window of tolerance and then they regulate and it can be happy. It can also be big emotions. So when we talk about the window of tolerance, there, there's a ceiling and a floor. There's the top and the bottom. So when you are dysregulated, you are either above the top of your window of tolerance. You're out of your window of tolerance to the top or you're out of your window of tolerance to the bottom. And some kids or some humans, even it's not just kids specific. I just work with the kids a lot with this. Their window is very short. So they have like a, t like a half window, like just a fire escape window. And so little stressors are going to bring them out of the window of tolerance instead of like if they had a bigger window, like a, like let's say a bay window in a living room where little stressors will, will have them wave up and down within that window of tolerance. Lindsay's like laughing at me. I'm making faces. But does that make sense? Does that make sense, Lindsay? I just love all the window references. Yeah. And I think it's, in, it's important to know that like our window of tolerance changes based on how, and our child's window of tolerance changes based on how much sleep we've had, the quality of food, water overstimulation all the things and so it's not like my window of tolerance is a bay window today and it's a bay window every day some days your kid is going to have a bay window some days they're going to have a fire escape yeah and that's, that's part of just you too as an adult and so when we're talking about co-regulating we're trying to pay attention to the signs of when we ourselves or our children are out of their window for whatever reason that day. And co-regulating is bringing them back in to their window via different skills. And most importantly, your nervous system. Your nervous system is going to help pattern and teach their nervous system that this is okay and we're moving back into our window of tolerance. Yes, and modeling is the most, most important parenting tool that we have at our disposal. And so our nervous system is giving their nervous system calm. Yes, exactly. So we're gonna talk about the four responses when um, our nervous system is out of the window of tolerance and what they can look like in your kids. Um, they are fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. I know that Paige talked a little bit earlier about fight. This could be physical but it's also verbal, like yelling, getting more aggressive. And keep in mind, it can also be turned inward. So some kids have a fight response towards themselves. So I don't deserve to be in this family. I'm so dumb. I can't believe I did that. They'll be like attacking themselves or they'll be attacking you and blaming you for what's happening or whoever they're interacting with. A flight response looks like, I call these my turtle kids, like, the kid that runs into their room and they wait to calm down until uh, they wait to come out until they have calmed down. So they feel safe 
and then they come out of their shell again. Yeah, I love that. Can you think of any other examples of flight? Sometimes there's like racing thoughts with this because um, we've kind of been socially conditioned to stay and listen. And so it's like racing thoughts, not able to focus, um, thinking about other things, being distracted. Yep. Those are all the things I would have mentioned. I think I try to pay a lot of attention to the internal signs to help parents and kids understand what's internally for them, how they're responding in the moment. Because again, we can't always actually physically escape, but there is also a mental escape, but it's a little bit different than freeze. I also want to bring up neurodivergence as far as it comes for flight, because we experience rejection sensitive dysphoria in life with neurodivergent people. And so this is when um, feedback or constructive criticism or even like gentle correction is perceived um, basically as a personal attack, like a character attack, and it's felt, and, and it brings out big emotions, right? This dysregulates us. And a lot of the times, so like two of my kids do this, where example, last night, my five-year-old was tired, super tired. This is our first week back to school. So that already lets me know we're in fire escape status with this window of tolerance. And I, um, she took a pillow away from her other sister and her sister started crying. So I corrected her and I said, your sister is using that pillow. Please go get a different pillow from your bedroom. And she immediately was like, it's all my fault and starts crying. And it's like, what are you talking about? But that's a really good example right there of the fight response and rejection sensitive dysphoria. Well, and I just want to uh, wrap that up with the flight response too, because what happens, I actually just had this uh, conversation in the last session I did with a client, is sometimes people will, um, they know they know that they experience intense emotions when it comes to rejection and criticism. And so then they go for perfection. Mm -hmm. And perfection is actually a flight response to get away from having to deal with the uncomfortable emotions that might arise if someone criticizes us doesn't like our work so it's like we don't even try mm -hmm. because if if I don't try nobody can criticize me or I go overboard and do it perfectly because I know that I can't manage the feelings of being correct eh? yes exactly perfect so let's go with freeze I have a real-time example of this when I was a teenager um real fucked up the yada 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 you guys have heard it before so I was trying to trying to live with my dad and my stepmom um and I hadn't been there very long and I don't even remember what happened but my stepmom got pissed and started yelling at me and I froze and by freeze my brain was so overwhelmed and so stressed that I actually mentally checked out I don't know what she said or how she said it and then I clicked back in because she threatened to hit me and I immediately got up and removed myself from the room. And then she chased me down. So then I removed myself from the household. <laughs> so it's like when we say freeze, like that is a real life example to me of like, I froze. I to this day still cannot tell you what she said or what she was angry about until the moment when I needed to like force myself into a different level of protection. I am a freezer in a lot of areas because for the same reason like there was danger and so I just like wouldn't move hold still and it's like this deer in the headlights look like you're like almost I've seen it in kids when I was working in foster homes and I could tell when they would go into a freeze response interacting with their foster parent and I had this one his eyes would get all big and he was just like deer in the headlights like frozen you can't see yeah. him, but acting it out right literally now. me and so and you hear people who survived like sexual assault talk about this response. It's a, it's a evolutionary thing that is created to protect us. So when we don't feel like we can fight or flight, we will freeze like an animal that plays dead. So if an animal that feels like it can't get away and it can't fight back, it will play dead. And that is what freeze is, is you are currently dead. So you are in no danger. And then <laughs> something can happen to like, click it back on. Yeah. And so in my experience, I try to look at it from the perspective of my stepmother as in like, what would this look like if I was the parent in this situation? And the thing that clicked me out of it 
was, I just want to slap that stupid look off your face. And I clicked in, I was like, bink. And so that lets me know that like something was happening with my face when I was in that freeze, like a, like deer in the headlight situation. Like it probably, it was probably my resting bitch face. Cause you know, she'd been solid since day one, but it wasn't like, I was trying to be disrespectful. Cause yes, I was a teenager, but like, because of my experiences and past trauma, like that's how my brain was protecting myself. Mm-hmm. So as a okay, parent, it lets me know like, Hey, get curious. Like if she would have said like, what's happening with your face, right? Or something, right? So if something's happening, sometimes I'm just like, so what's happening right now? And my kids are like, I don't know. And I was like, me either. But this is what your face was doing. <laughs> well, right. And I think we'll get into this more too in our neuroaffirming nugget, but the differences between a stress behavior and a misbehavior, because a lot of times what we perceive as misbehavior is a stress response. Yes. Okay. So let's move into fawn and then we'll wrap you up. So fawn is, you think like a cute little deer, people pleasing. Um, and so this is saying whatever you need to say to get out of danger, doing whatever you need to do, playing the role that the other person wants you to play. So if you have a child that tends to people please, this is probably one of their main um, stress responses. And you see this come out a lot in interpersonal reactions. And so sometimes, and this is why compliance from our kids is not always a sign of being calm, because if they feel like they're in danger, and I don't necessarily mean that physically, I just mean their bodies perceiving the conflict as danger, then they may just say what they need to say to move forward. And so that's why sometimes you'll have your kids like, in the moment, it'll be like, yeah, we have this conversation and they feel, and I feel like they totally understand me when maybe they were really activated. And then like the next day they're doing the same thing. It's because the conversation's not landing because they're in fight or flight and they're, or if they're in fawn and they're using fawn to remove themselves from the conflict. Yeah. It's like hostage situation. Now we're besties and I'm in love with you. So mm-hmm. I'm going to die. Yeah. Absolutely. That's fun. And I was going to say something else, but I can't remember. So that's the ADHD. Oh, I was going to ask, do you feel like um, we masking sometimes can tend to fall into fun where it's like, oh, I have this personality with this person because I know that's what's going to be well accepted. Uh huh. Yes. Well accepted. I don't know if that's a phrase, but I was just like a thought I had because understanding who we are in our own identity development in a neuro diverse world like uh, my family threw me a surprise birthday party two years ago and I still to this day get feedback on I looked angry when I walked in (laughs) and I was like it's because you didn't prepare me so I could mask and like act appropriately like I wasn't sure I and if you ask me what my emotions were I was like I loved it I'm so grateful for all the people that came and like took that time and that planning and the money that went into it. But like, you would not have read that on my face at all. And I still get feedback about that from my family members. And I was like, well, if you had told me what was happening, I would have been able to act more socially appropriate instead of being surprised. And then my brain is like, oh no, something different. And then I'm just like, uh. Well, yeah. And I think that's the perfect example of how We need to get curious with people we care about and our children because we don't always know what's going on internally for them. So like that could very well be misconstrued as you like not liking the party, not being appreciative. I can never say that word appreciative of what your family had done for you. And if some people are like sensitive or, you know, take things really personally, they could take that really personally. And as a parent, I could totally see that. Like I've um, like when your kids are opening gifts on Christmas, like it's super overstimulating. And a lot of times we get upset because they don't have the response we want them to have, but it's because overstimulation and excitement can throw you into um, dysregulation as well. And so just being aware of those things. So we know when it's a stress behavior rather than a misbehavior. Yes. Okay. So tune in next week where we are going to walk you through teaching regulation to your kids.
Thanks for coming to Mindful as a Mother podcast. If you'd like more of us and Mindful as a Mother, you can find Paige at Instagram at Parenting with Paige and Lindsay at Linz underscore Adams LCSW. Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and in our Facebook group, creating community and smashing parental stigma, embracing mindful motherhood and positive parenting. Thanks so much and see you next time.